Hello. You're listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Rafael Kachturian. With us today is Asad Haider. Asad is a founding editor of Viewpoint Magazine and the author of Mistaken Identity, Race and Class in the Age of Trump, published by Verso in 2018. Currently, he's a visiting assistant professor of philosophy at the New School. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I want to begin in the not-so-distant past. Uh, in 2016, Donald Trump won a heated election. Uh, at that time, the popular narrative was that this was the so-called revenge of the repressed white working class. Uh, and the conventional wisdom at the time was that Trump used populist rhetoric to strategically appeal to latent, deep racial resentments and status anxieties, uh, especially held by downwardly mobile whites in certain parts of the country. Uh, now we have over three years of hindsight. And how well do you think that argument has fared? Um, can we say about something about how it was symptomatic of the politics and ideology of contemporary American liberalism that this became a, a predominant narrative? Yeah, I think you're right that um, this repressed white working class was largely a fantasy of liberal intellectuals. Um, there is no such cohesive group acting as a political block in US politics. The typical trends of elections are that um, higher income voters tend to favor Republicans and right-wing politicians. And the explanation for the election of Donald Trump has to be not at the level of the uh, consciousness or ideas of individual white people who are voting, but in terms of the overall structures uh, of the American political system um, and the class composition of the United States, I think it's quite clear that there was a structural political crisis, um, a crisis of the political parties which is continuing today. And the uh, fact that the existing political system um, uh, totally failed to represent the um, political needs and demands of uh, the vast majority of the American population. And so I think that um, this chimerical white working class uh, can easily function as an explanation uh, for people who don't want to really confront this crisis of the political system. Uh, I want to come back to this, this question of the crisis of the political system um, towards the end of our conversation as well. But uh, we can maybe use the Trump phenomenon as a way to pivot towards um, a kind of theoretical discussion of the way that race and class relations have been thought about uh, in the sense that a large portion of your work focuses on how we can think of these social relations that have always been closely entwined in the history of capitalism, but actually um, the precise relation between them has been a matter of a lot of controversy. Uh, you yourself have occasionally pointed to Stewart's Hall, a well-known formulation that race is the modality in which class is lived. And there have been many debates over the years about the pr precise relationship between race and class. So Marxist accounts um, are often said by their critics to be guilty of economic reductivism to the point that the pushback against Marxist narratives does the opposite and treats race and class in almost mutually exclusive kind of orthogonal terms. Uh, so why has the intersection of race and class in capitalist societies been such, such a controversial topic? And where do you see yourself in these discussions and the conversations? Well, first of all, um, understanding the relation between race and class is um, an extremely complicated historical and theoretical problem because in American history, there's no question that they are mutually constitutive categories. There is no way that you could possibly understand uh, the development of American capitalism and the uh, composition of the American working class without noting that uh, a huge portion of the labor performed in the transition to capitalism was done by slaves. And the, uh, the emergence of racial categories is absolutely central to the process by which um, the categories of wage labor and um, the uh, forms of exploitation that emerge in American history uh, are actually shaped. So 
first of all, this is a complicated analytical problem. I mean, when you're trying to talk about any of these categories in isolation from each other, you're not going to adequately explain what happened. Um, but second, it's a political question, because there's also no doubt that, as W.B. Du Bois put it, there was a failure for the two great labor movements of American history to merge, and that was the abolitionist movement and the uh, movement of uh, free wage laborers. Mm -hmm. And the failure of these movements to merge and um, attack a common exploiter is uh, part of the basis for the reproduction of race throughout American history. And so this is, um, this is the political aspect of the problem, which is to understand how to um, overcome that division and make uh, an anti-racist politics integral to a class politics and, and a class politics integral to an anti-racist politics. And this has been difficult to achieve largely because of the racism of the official labor movements. And um, we can point to that, but we also have to point to the fact that frequently this racism was challenged and um, overcome in uh, forms of solidarity uh, that were uh, expressed in political action. Now, Stuart Hall's comment that race is the modality in which classes lived, it's a very interesting statement, um, which is, I think, hard to understand in isolation from the broader argument, which is Hall's analysis of how the working class in the UK is really shaped by the um, uh, categorization of workers according to migration uh, and so on. And his analysis is that because the working class is racially structured, that many workers will only come to a consciousness of their class position by first understanding their racial position. And that this is actually, uh, th th this is not something that can just be seen as um, secondary to some kind of direct realization of a class consciousness, but it's actually the way that class consciousness happens. So you actually can't have a class politics if you ignore that fact. Um, and so that's the political argument there. And just to stay on this topic for a moment, in Mistaken Identity, you write that the phenomenon of whiteness can't actually be explained through an understanding of an individual's identity, but rather, to quote, uh, the social structure and its constitutive relations within which individuals are composed. So can you elaborate a little bit on how we see whiteness, how we can see whiteness as a social relation that helps reproduce race then on an individualized level? Or in other words, what do we gain by thinking of race in structural terms rather than as a matter of individual identity? Yeah, so if we think of whiteness just in terms of people believing that they're white, uh, we're not going to be able to explain how it is that uh, people who belong to so many different uh, cultures, histories, languages, national origins, and so on, were gathered together in the United States into the category of white. Uh, that's a complicated historical process, uh, and it's not one that's automatic. Um, the famous case study of this is Noel Ignatiev's How the Irish Became White, which sets out to try to understand why it is that a group which was racialized in Europe and understood to be inferior um, then became incorporated into the club of the white race um, through the, ex the extension of certain privileges and advantages. And um, it's only by understanding these historical and political processes that have made it possible for people to belong to a category like whiteness that didn't already exist that we can see uh, why it's a, um, why it matters um, as as a category at all. Um, it's only in the sense that it's part of a process of racial formation uh, of the way that people are inserted into different hierarchies uh, that we can even make sense of it. And I think that a lot of the contemporary discussion of white privilege is too much about the um, individual thoughts and behaviors of white people, um, which can't explain why those thoughts and behaviors have any political meaning. Mm 
And in your writing in Viewpoint and elsewhere, you've also emphasized the kind of radical origins of identity politics, of the, of the term itself that have been forgotten. So identity politics as a form of theoretical critique and as a form of revolutionary political practice. Um, as you pointed out, the notion of identity politics originated with the black feminist lesbian organization, the Kampahi River Collective, which was active during the 70s. So what did identity politics mean for the CRC in that original context? And can we speculate about what allowed the kind of initial emancipatory connotations that this term had to become detached and then re-articulated as a basically a liberal form of politics that was then compatible with capitalism? The Combahee River Collective Statement comes out of a period um, in which a number of mass movements had um, achieved a great deal of political change, but had also come up against important limits. And um, some of those limits had to do with the hegemonic identities that were internal to those movements. So what the Kambi River Collective pointed out was that um, f it frequently seemed to be that in black nationalist movements and so on that um, black men were seen to be representative of the whole black community and the interests of black women were marginalized. Uh, the labor movement frequently is seemed to assume that uh, workers are white men. Uh, the women's liberation movement um, presented uh, the interests of white women as standing in for women as a whole. And so the proposal of a politics that came from black women's identities was a way of challenging these hegemonic identities and um, trying to advance an emancipatory politics that went beyond those limits. And that's why the statement says, if black women become free, then everyone will have to become free. The idea is still that there is the possibility of freedom for everyone, but that that is impossible when these hegemonic identities have marginalized black women. And so I think that this context of mass movements and a very um, specific political critique of, of the um, existing strategies and aims of these mass movements, uh, that's the only context in which you can understand the Kambahi River Collective Statement. Mm -hmm. If the term identity politics becomes uprooted from that context, uh, it becomes a kind of free-floating signifier, mm -hmm. uh, which now, I think, um, has no clear meaning. Um, the, the, the meaning is constantly changing and being assigned in different ways depending on the character of the conversation. So I, I, my argument is not that the current use of identity politics is some kind of um, deviation from the true meaning or a betrayal of the origin or something like that. What I want to point out is that there is a real political antagonism here between the emancipatory project of the Combahee River Collective and the contemporary politics, which is about individual recognition and recognition from the state. And you are deeply grounded in the Marxist tradition, and uh, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about what makes a Marxist perspective compelling today as a theory of politics and society. So maybe to put it in different words, what is still living about Marxism? And is it even does it even make sense to speak of Marxism rather than Marxisms? Um, so rather than a single unified body of texts and practices, but as a, a series of contestations that have unfolded over the course of time? So there are many levels to this question, and one one point is that I agree with you that um, unfortunately a lot of the discussion of Marxism today seems to assume that it's um, a set of already determined answers to whatever questions may come up in the course of political practice. Of course, that's not the case. Um, pretty much any question um, that you have, you can find a huge range of Marxist positions and uh, very vicious debates back and forth between the different positions on them. So it's not possible to just say the Marxist position on this is X. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a problem, I think, because um, these supposed solutions are taken out of very different historical situations. 
and um, we can't just uh, transpose um, a political position or approach that was appropriate in 1915 to the present. Mm -hmm. And the, the greatest representatives of the Marxist tradition did not seek to do this. They sought to um, build from the ground up their theoretical approach in a way that was appropriate for the present while still drawing on this historical legacy. And that's what we have to do um, if we want to think about Marxism today. The reason I would suggest that we need to maintain the perspective of Marxism is partly uh, a political one, which is that Marxism presented a perspective of emancipation in the context of the emergence of capitalist society. And that is a condition that we have still not overcome. Uh, so the critique of capitalist society and the recognition that any emancipatory project needs to overcome capitalism is very much a living principle. But it's not just because of this perspective that Marxism is uh, a political um, uh, is, is a central political fact for us. It's also that the emancipatory movements that have um, been fundamental in history from the 19th century through the whole 20th century took up Marxism as their perspective and they developed it and adapted it for their particular situations. But they showed that Marxism was not just um, a set of ideas or a theory, but an active organizing force for emancipatory projects. And I would say there we, we can look at this in a few different ways. It was taken up in the revolutions which overthrew the existing states and instituted new um, states that were supposed to engage in a transition to a socialist society. It was taken up in the national liberation struggles uh, and in the struggle against imperialism, and it was taken up in the labor movements, um, which uh, won major changes in the working conditions of people uh, throughout the advanced capitalist world. Um, at the same time, I think we have to recognize that Marxism entered into a kind of crisis at all of these levels. So the transitional societies did not arrive at socialism. They failed to elaborate a different kind of life and um, the fact that the Marxist political project was equated with taking over the state was a fundamental limit um, to the achievement of a different kind of society. The national liberation struggles, anti-imperialism frequently ran up against the limit of new kinds of national sovereignty which reproduced the structures of the nation state. The labor movement frequently ended up being incorporated into the operations of capitalism as a kind of junior partner. And so all of these things kind of represent a crisis for Marxism that happens in the late 20th century. And uh, I think it's impossible to pretend that Marxism could just be preserved unchanged um, without recognizing this crisis and confronting it. And I think that um, it, one of the important things we can do in studying the Marxist tradition is to try to find out how this crisis was understood and how people tried to think past it and to um, reconceive of Marxism mm -hmm. uh, for the present. Mm -hmm. And I think in that process of the reconceiving of Marxism, it's important to still retain the possibility of emancipation as a political project. Um, and building on the work of scholars like Etienne Balibar, Massimiliano Tomba, and others, you advocate for a notion of insurgent universality um, as something that is a necessary component of emancipatory politics that we can aspire to. At one point, you write that uh, this notion manifests itself in acts of insurgency that demand emancipation not only for those involved, but for all of the oppressed. Um, so could you elaborate on this? I think you began to talk about this a little bit um, in discussion in the discussion of the Kambahi River Collective, but what new light does this framework shed on emancipatory struggles, both historically and in the present? Well, I think that 
when we look at the history of emancipatory struggles, we, this is definitely a principle that we see that's advanced. The principle is not that um, a few people should be exempted from slavery, but that no one should be a slave. This is the principle of every slave revolt, that slavery must be abolished. Um, in all of the great revolutions, I think that we see the uh, idea that the domination of everyone can be overcome. And I think it's very important to remain faithful to this idea. I think that when we try to conceive of universality, we have to take the lead of these actual historical events in which the possibility of overcoming everyone's domination was presented in a very material form in the revolt of those who are excluded and the possibility of uh, transforming society. Um, I don't think that we can formulate universality at the level of abstraction by talking about, um, even by talking about universal rights or by talking about some kind of universal human nature that would yield a particular set of principles. I think it's only in those moments in which the concrete existence of domination is challenged and people assert their agency to change society that we see this um, universality in action. Just to follow up on that, uh, does this idea imply the possibility and necessity of communism? Or do you see insurgent universality and communism as operating on two different historical and theoretical registers? I think that um, insofar as it's useful to preserve the name communism today, it has to be precisely the um, absolutely egalitarian principle of um, the emancipation of all. And I think in this sense that um, a politics of universal emancipation is a communist politics in the sense that it, um, that it places this absolute egalitarianism as the first condition of freedom. Uh, you have to, I think, in response to the um, reality of capitalist society, make equality the first condition before you have freedom, because uh, freedom without equality uh, means the freedom only of some. Mm -hmm. And this e equality is the principle which is actually negated uh, in every capitalist society. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, communism remains relevant uh, insofar as it um, makes the absolute commitment to egalitarianism the condition of emancipation. To kind of turn to contemporary struggles and the, the present day, so to bring us back to, to the, uh, our current conjuncture, uh, Viewpoint uh, was founded almost a decade ago with this goal of rethinking radical struggles in Marxist theory and practice. Uh, at the time, of course, the world was still shakily recovering from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And that moment also produced new collective struggles in the form primarily of anti-austerity movements uh, in Greece and Spain and Portugal. Uh, the Arab Spring could be seen maybe as part of those struggles. And in the United States, fall 2011 gave us the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, uh, the movement, of course, was often credited with helping create a new generation of activists that are still at work today. And Viewpoint's first issue was, in fact, titled Occupy Everything. So I want to invite you to maybe reflect a little bit on that particular moment and the way that your thoughts have changed about that time, if you recall your initial diagnosis of that moment versus what you think of it now. Um, are there still traces of it in the present um, or, or do you see it as having been subsumed into something else? Well, this is a very important part of what Viewpoint set out to do, which was that we set out to try to elaborate theory in the context of social movements and to recover um, aspects of the Marxist tradition which we thought dealt with concrete organizational questions and strategic questions that um, 
either were not thought through in the present or that had been su kind of submerged under um, a set of um, what I described before as pre-formulated answers that um, Marxism got reduced to. So we wanted to look at the um, complexity of the Marxist tradition, but reading it through the lens of the contemporary social movements and the questions that they raised. So one thing I will say about that moment, which you know, the Occupy moment was fundamental for this, was that we wanted to try to understand the role of class and what, what understanding of class could really explain not only how, how different groups operated within the everyday life of our society, but also how um, the politics of a social movement like Occupy represented classes. So this idea of the 1% to the 99% seemed to be a kind of way of pointing to the question of class, but one which was sort of um, empty in the sense that these the, the, there was the idea of the many and the few, mm -hmm. but there was not an explanation of how um, each group related to a an underlying economic social structure or what the relation between them was. And so we became interested in this um, method of class composition which came out of Italian Marxism and it was uh, out of, let's, let's specify it, at Italian workerism in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think this was a way of, first of all, of trying to understand class in a more capacious way, not in the kind of very one-dimensional and reductive way that um, seemed to be um, kind of becoming popular, but also to try to think about what the relation was between class categories and political actors. Mm -hmm. And so to me, this second question was very important. So I, I would say there, there, these are the two aspects of the method that were important in thinking about class. First of all, undermining the idea of class as some kind of pre-given, already constituted category, and second, actually trying to pose the question of what the relationship was between the social existence of a given class and its political action. Now, I don't subscribe to this framework so much anymore. Um, I think that there were many interesting insights that it yielded but I think that now the most important question is to try to formulate um, a conception of emancipatory politics first and foremost, um, rather than trying to derive emancipatory politics from a social analysis of class, which I think is what many people tried to do. And I think a lot of the analysis of race and class that one sees uh, among certain Marxists who recognize the importance of anti-racist movements is to try to find a way to unite them in their objective analysis so as to guarantee their emancipatory character. Mm -hmm. So there's already an agreement among Marxists that class struggles are part of a project for universal emancipation. So if you can show how race is intrinsically a part of class, then you show that struggles against racism are also emancipatory. But I think this gets the the this logic is backwards because I think first you have to um, you you have to identify the possibility of an emancipatory politics which is as, as I said earlier is a politics which is for all rather than for some and then you see that an, a, a struggle against racism doesn't need to be guaranteed by its um, relationship to class in an objective analysis to be understood to be emancipatory so I think these questions, now I think that these questions of social analysis come after formulating a politics of emancipation. And to wrap up, uh, staying on this topic a little bit, the present conjuncture is uh, an exciting one in many ways. What do you see as the most pressing questions and demands for social struggles today in 2020, you know, as compared to 2011 or 2016? Uh, what do you think has been carried over from those years and what is in fact 
quite novel to our own moment right now. Well, the first thing I want to say is that I don't think that um, the practice of making predictions is very useful, and people really like to do this. Um, some people think that this is like a um, this is what makes Marxism better than other ways of thinking because you can make predictions about when the next economic crisis will happen and so on. And of course, actually look at the history of Marxism, and you will recognize that this is. Um, this has nothing. This has no relation to the actual history, uh, because um, the predictions are constantly wrong. Mm -hmm. And I would say that many completely reasonable predictions since 2011 about what the Occupy movement would lead to um, turned out to be wrong. Um, most predictions of um, various left to liberal intellectuals about who would win the 2016 uh, election were wrong. And so I don't think that it's that useful to make predictions now. Um, certainly my um, instincts about what would happen politically now were um, much more pessimistic than seems to be appropriate, given the kinds of developments we're seeing. Uh, I've been taken by surprise by them, and um, I think that we have to think through them. Um, I think the... Uh, mobilizations around the Bernie Sanders campaign, I think that they are not, um, what's important about them is not the fact that they may result in certain policy changes or even that they might result in uh, Bernie Sanders' election, though these things might happen, and certainly many of the policy changes that are, are being advocated would make a huge difference in people's everyday lives. But I think the important thing is that new masses of people are mobilizing around the idea that it's possible to totally change our existing system, that it's possible to put the whole political structure into question and conceive of a different kind of politics. Um, and I think many young people and other people are um, really uh, coming to uh, embrace this idea. And so I think that uh, that has to be affirmed and it has to be carried forward. And affirming it may sometimes mean taking a distance from the um, more pragmatic political considerations. And it means that we have to be, um, at the same time that we're attentive to the new achievements and new openings, we, we can't um, become uh, we can't become complacent uh, about the real obstacles that are put in our path. Um, certainly, we've already seen many attempts to undermine uh, this campaign, and we're going to see even more um, brutal ones. And so there has to be the possibility of maintaining a lasting organizational expression of the challenge to the existing order that is independent from the state and independent from the electoral process. Um, because the worst disaster would be if, for whatever set of reasons, Bernie Sanders loses, his campaign is suppressed, and then there is no alternative politics available. So that has to be constructed independently, and uh, I think it's uh, very important that people start to work on that now. Assad Haider, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you.